Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to the FDR Library's Hudson Valley History Reading Festival. This is our second session today. I'm Paul Sparrow. I'm the director at the FDR Library, uh, and we're so pleased to have you all here today. Uh, we wish we were open so we could do this live. Uh, hopefully, certainly looking forward to it next year. Uh, but we're going to go to our, our second author today. Uh, his name is David Levine, uh, and his book, uh, goes back a little further in history than we normally do here. Uh, it's called, uh, he's the author of the book, The Hudson Valley, The First 250 Million Years. It's a short book. It's a mostly chronological and occasionally personal history. Uh, uh, David is a freelance writer and editor and is the co-author, author, and ghostwriter of six sports books, including Life on the Rim and In the Land of Giants. I assume that's about basketball. Uh, he currently writes about lifestyle and general interest topics from history and business to beer and baseball. As a contributing writer for Hudson Valley, Westchester, and the uh, 914 Inc. magazines. He lives in Albany, New York with his wife, Kimberly, and his daughter, Grace, uh, and his faithful dog, Sadie. Uh, it's a put back on your time machine goggles as Davis takes us back to the age of dinosaurs and describes the history of the Hudson River Valley. David, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am also glad that we're able to do this, even if it is virtually. So to hello to everyone out there in the matrix. Thanks for logging in. And uh, thanks for listening to my little talk here. Um, so yes, as Paul said, my name is David Levine. I'm a journalist. Uh, I've been a writer, uh, not quite since FDR was president, but uh, almost that far back since the Carter administration, when I took a college internship with a local newspaper in Rochester, New York. Uh, I've been a working writer and editor since then. Uh, my work's been published in the New York Times, Sports Illustrated, uh, US News and World Report, American Heritage, and a whole bunch of other places. And as Paul said, I've published six books about sports. Yes, the land of the, in the land of giants is about basketball. It was the autobiography of uh, Muggsy Bogues, who is in no way a giant. Um, so anyway, uh, this is the first book I've written in about 25 years. Uh, it came out last year, and I was supposed to be at the uh, reading festival last year, of course, before COVID got in the way. Um, so I'm glad to be back touring, as it were, and uh, talking about the book. Um, so how did this book come to be? I began writing for Hudson Valley Magazine in 2007 as a contributing writer. And about three years later, the editors said they were gonna start a history column and they asked me to write it, <clears throat> excuse me. So I said yes, because I'm a freelance writer and I have to say yes to everything that pays. But uh, some yeses are better than others. And this one turned out to be one of the best yeses I ever yesed. Um, I'm not from the Hudson Valley originally, so I didn't know a lot of the history. Uh, I have come to learn that it's as historic a region as any in the country. Um, I've lived in the Albany area for about 30 odd years, some of them very odd. Um, but uh, except for some day trips and weekend um, excursions down the valley, uh, you know, to eat at funky restaurants or to stay at cool places like the Mohonk Mountain House, I didn't really know how much has been going on here in the Hudson Valley for such a long, long time. So over the past 10, 11 years, I've learned. Beginning with my first history assignment about the nature writer, John Burroughs, and continuing through the most recent article to make this book, which was uh, about Alexander Hamilton's time in the Hudson Valley, uh, I've had the great pleasure of immersing myself in 250 million years of Hudson Valley history. From the dinosaurs that left their fossilized tracks here to the glaciers, that carved the lakes and shaped the hills here, from the first peoples to first contact, from colonial rule to independence, from the slave society to the civil war, from the birth of the modern nation to the happy rise of craft beer, uh, the Hudson Valley has quite a story to tell. In fact, many stories. Uh, the book contains about 70 stories uh, that were as I said, um, collated from articles that I wrote for Hudson Valley and other magazines. Uh, and for this little uh, presentation, <clears throat> I'd like to read short excerpts from a, a dozen or so of them, just to give you a sense of my style, 
Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm not a historian, so I hope to make this a little bit more fun. Um, but also to uh, test your knowledge a little bit about the Hudson Valley, I'm gonna throw in a question uh, in the middle of each reading, and I'll give you each a second or two to think about it. If we were in person, I would let you raise your hands, but we can't do that. So I'll just let you think about it, <clears throat> and then I'll give you the answer. Just sort of a little Hudson Valley Jeopardy. And then after that, we'll do the Q&A. If you have any cues, I'll try to provide the A's. So, um, Cliff, how about the first slide? Jurassic Park, Chester. The midday sun directly over the equatorial region of the great landmass Pangaea, sears the warm and forbidding land. A creature leaves the herd and scurries across the edge of a marsh to find cover behind a fern. She waits perched on three bird-like toes, supporting her hind legs. She is not a bird though, she's a lizard who stands about three feet tall at the hips, but leaning forward spans nearly 10 feet from nose to tail. She's looking to add to her 40 pound frame. She's looking for lunch. Other beasts are grazing nearby on the fruit, leaves, and the cycads and other tropical plants that forest the region. <clears throat> but our creature wants meat. When a small furry animal, rodent dish, but not rodent, pops out of its nest, he snaps it up in her long, powerful jaws, crunches it easily, and speeds off gracefully to rejoin the herd leaving behind nothing but footprints in that marshy mud slowly drying under the deep sky. More than 200 million years later, those very footprints, or at least some like them, will be found thousands of miles away in latitude and longitude, in an unexpected place, in a world unfathomably different from that in which they were left. So here's your question, where were those footprints left? You can hum the Jeopardy theme song here, do, 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 do. And the answer is, they were found in Nyack Beach State Park in Haverstraw in Rockland County. <clears throat> These tracks and the relatively few other clues left in our geologic neighborhood from the Mesozoic era, tell us what the lower Hudson Valley was like during the age of the dinosaurs. These were the first dinosaur fossils found in New York State discovered in 1972. Imprinted in slabs of rock that now belong to the New York State Museum in Albany, the footprints belong to the type of lizard known as a growlator. <clears throat> Excuse me, our beast was probably Coelephesus, a slender bipedal carnivore that lived throughout the East Coast of what we call North America. It's also found in other parts of the world because back then there was no North America. There was no New York, no Hudson River, no Rockland County. There was only Pangaea. So now we know what the Hudson Valley was like 200 and some million years ago. And I think it's fascinating to think of our area being located in the middle of what's now the Atlantic Ocean, thousands of miles away, uh, with creatures like this running all over it. Next slide. Ice capades. When you or I stand on the great lawn at the Vanderbilt Mansion in Hyde Park, we picture ourselves living the grand lifestyle of fin de siècle Hudson Valley aristocracy, of opulent balls and market rigging business dealings, all held amid the stunning landscape of the river and the mountains under Frederick Church skies. When Joanna and Robert Titus stand on that same lawn, they picture something a bit different. <clears throat> in their mind's eye, they're knee deep in water at the edge of a vast lake that stretches from the middle of the eastern Hudson Valley counties to the middle of the western counties and from somewhere near Glens Falls all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, which is about 100 miles farther south than it is now. Far to their north, a glacier thousands of feet high that once covered the continent from the middle of Long Island west through Cleveland, Chicago, and Omaha to the Dakotas and Montana and the Great Northwest is in the process of melting its way back to the Arctic. The Tituses you see are standing at the Vanderbilt Mansion circa 15,000 years BP, the geological term for before present. They recently published a delightful book called The Hudson Valley and the Ice Age. Part popular science, part travelogue, <clears throat> it is that rare science book 
that is both challenging and entertaining. Readers learn about arcane geological formations like moraines, alluvial fans, and rock drumlins. Better yet, they learn where to find the remnants of these formations through first-person hikes and drive-bys at a dozen easily accessible spots up and down the valley. Consider them postcards from the Ice Age. So I'm in Albany. Oh, I'm sorry. I asked the Tituses to pick a handful of their favorite spots to get interested parties started on their own geological time travel. Once you do, our beautiful valley will never look quite the same to you again. So I live in Albany, and my question is, which geological remnant of the Ice Age is Albany County's most famous landmass? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Those of you who don't live in Albany County or have never been here may not know. But the answer is the Albany Pine Bush. These days, the Pine Bush Preserve in Albany County is a foliage-covered plot of hilly, sandy soil. Just after the glaciers retreated, though, it was a full-blown desert. Quote, all that was missing were camels, Robert Titus says. The sand was blown in from what is now Schenectady County, which then was one of Lake Albany's biggest deltas, fed by the Mohawk River. As the lake retreated, the sandy deposits were, that were its bottom were blown to the west, I'm sorry, were blown by the west winds and dropped here, forming the dunes and swales that have since been overgrown. Quote, stand on top of the dunes and imagine what the area looked like 12,000 years ago he suggests. Next slide, please. The First Peoples. A great many people traveled from the north and west. For years, they moved across the land, leaving settlements in rich river valleys as others moved on. Reaching the eastern edge of the country, some of these people settled the river later named the Delaware. Others moved north and settled in the valley of the river where the waters were like those of their original homeland. They named this river Mahikanatuk and called themselves Mahikoniak. This is the origin story as told by an early 1700s Mohican historian named Hendrik Alpamat of the people who truly discovered America, including the river valley in which we now live, and they, for the most part, do not. The river and valley's name were usurped by a man named Henry Hudson, a member of an invasive species from the east that in the comparative blink of an eye nearly ended a story that stretches back perhaps 13,000 years. <clears throat> Today about 1,500 men, women, and children, most of whom live in Wisconsin, trace their ancestry back to the great people who traveled from the north and west as the Ice Age glaciers receded and humans first populated our land. That the descendants of these original settlers, settlers are doing well after 400 years of disease, degradation, and dislocation is good to know. It is still better to know their story in full, to appreciate their history and honor their pride of place as the first people of the Hudson River. So the question for this one is, they named the river the Mahikanatuk. What does that translate to in English? Again, <clears throat> take a moment, think about it. As many of you may know, it translates to the people of the waters that are never still or the river that flows two ways. Because of course, the river is not really a river, it's an estuary, so it rises and falls with the tide. It flows two ways. Next, please. The Oblong. There aren't many Quakers in Quaker Hill anymore. But in the 18th century, this hamlet in the town of Pauling was one of the most thriving Quaker communities in the country. It would be romantic to think that the early settlers came to this area because of some great spiritual awakening or metaphysical yearning. But what drew them here was far more prosaic, real estate. It's still a pretty good story though. Back in the early 1700s, the colonies of New York and Connecticut were arguing about the exact location of their shared border. The surveys were inaccurate 
and the colony's land allocations were often in dispute. <clears throat> the issue was finally settled in 1731. New York was awarded an amount of land two miles wide by 60 miles long, running along its eastern edge all the way up to Massachusetts. This patch of land was called the oblong, a much cooler word than rectangle, but basically the same thing. The oblong was unsettled wilderness at the time. It was special wilderness, wilderness for one particular reason. It really was wild. No one owned it. It was not included on any of the original Dutch patents, and therefore it immediately became the first New World land in a long time to go on the open market. One of the first to get in on the action was a surveyor named Nathan Birdsall, a Quaker who had visited the area in 1728. Quote, at the time the road ended at Danbury, so we had to cut through the forest to find it, says Robert P. Riley, Pauling's historian. When the land became available for purchase, Birdsall sent word to other Quaker communities in Long Island, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and a few hardy souls bought 500 acre plots around what they quickly christened Quaker Hill. <clears throat> Quote, it was kind of a land rush, says Riley. All right, your question here. New York got the oblong, that 60 by two mile rectangle. What did Connecticut get? I can hear you all thinking out there in TV land. The answer is <clears throat> Connecticut got that weird little panhandle that juts into Westchester County uh, at the southwestern corner of Connecticut. If you wonder why, uh, wonder why the border of Connecticut isn't just a straight line, it makes that funny little U-turn, that's why. Next, please. Hamilton slept here and here, here too. Alexander Hamilton is most often associated with three places. The Caribbean, where he was born and orphaned. New York City, where he spent most of his professional and political life and Weehawk in New Jersey, where he was mortally wounded at the famously pistoled hand of Aaron Burr. Missing from that GPS-inspired biography, however, is another place that defined Hamilton as much as the others, the Hudson Valley. From White Plains, where he fought alongside George Washington, to Albany, where he was wed and his children were baptized, to numerous spots in between, Hamilton spent a great deal of time all over the valley. Quote, what a huge part it played in his life and his family, says Nicole Schollett, president of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. He was so associated with New York City, but in every period of his life, the Hudson Valley played a major role. When you look at how much time he spent in the valley, <clears throat> it's a really important story. Hamilton made his first visit to the city that would become his second home, Albany, in 1777. Washington sent him there to ask General Horatio Gates to borrow some troops. Hamilton covered 60 miles a day for five days on horseback, quote, riding like a man possessed. Despite his already keen powers of persuasion, the 25-year-old Hamilton failed to convince Gates. It was not a total loss, however. He met and fell head over spurs for 22-year-old Eliza Schuyler. Quote, Hamilton is a gone man a colleague wrote. After the war, life was good for the Hamiltons until a fateful dinner <clears throat> at which Hamilton and others said some nasty things, quote, despicable opinion, in the words of an eyewitness, about Aaron Burr, Jefferson's vice president who was running for governor of New York. A guest at the dinner wrote about the comments in a letter which somehow ended up being published in the New York Evening Post. Burr ch challenged Hamilton to quote, an affair of honor, as duels were called. On the History Channel's list of all-time legendary duels, this one takes the top spot. Now the question is, where was that dinner held where the despicable opinion was offered? The answer was in Albany, <clears throat> at the home of Judge John Taylor, at a dinner party at 50 State Street. And if you know Albany, that's about where Jack's Oyster House is today. Next time you have oysters at Jack's, think about Hamilton and what he said. Next, Cliff, the Great Chain. 
From the earliest moments of the war for independence, each side knew that the key to victory was the Hudson River. Boston was the hotbed of the revolution, and most of General George Washington's Continental Army came from the Northeast. The river separated the New England states from the rest of the country. If the British took control of the Hudson, the head would be cut off from the body, and both sides knew what would follow. In 1776, the British had seized New York City, held on to Canada, and had a water route just about the entire way between the two. Blocking British ships became paramount. But American fortifications in the valley were not sufficient. George Washington needed a great idea. He got it from an English-born patriot named, named Thomas Matchen. Matchen knew water. He'd been an apprentice canal builder in England, and as a captain in an artillery company, he was called by Washington to help defend the river at the Hudson Highlands. The river was narrow there. And since ancient times, armies had placed sharpened logs, scuttled ships, and other debris in an arrows to block passage. But here the river was too deep. Manchin had his aha moment. Why not forge a large chain and float it across the river anchoring it to both shores. The British deemed the great chain so critical to victory that they were willing to pay a malcontent American general to deliver the plans to West Point so they could circumvent it. So here's a softball question. Who was that malcontent general? The answer, of course, is Benedict Arnold. Uh, what's interesting to me is that many people know that Arnold sold the plans to uh, West Point but the British didn't want it for the fort. They wanted it to get the chain out of the way. The fort at that point was not much of a fort at all. The real reason they wanted that piece of land was so they could reel back the chain and have command of the river. Next, please. Whale of a tale. <clears throat> Herman Melville called him Ishmael. As every English major knows, Ishmael joined a whaling crew led by a certain deranged peg-leg captain and set sail out of Nantucket in search of a very large, very white Leviathan. What most English majors and Hudson Valley residents don't know is that Melville just as readily could have penned the Pequod's launching its doomed voyage out of Poughkeepsie or Newburgh or, most plausibly, which city in the Hudson Valley? That's your question. Which city am I talking about? The answer, for anyone who's been there, is Hudson. Because from just after the Revolutionary War until the 1840s, Hudson was one of the most important whaling centers in the country. Well, blow me down. Who knew? The Hudson Valley's whaling heritage is fascinating. In fact, without it, the city of Hudson might not exist at all. So. Here's your extra credit question. What was the town called before it became a whaling center? It was called Claverack Landing at the time, a farm community of about 10 families. Whaling, one of the world's largest and most important industries at the time, was the furthest thing from the community's mind. So was the ocean, which was more than 100 miles away. It's so funny to me from not being around here and to many people who hear this story for the first time to think that whaling was a big deal from the Hudson River that far up from the ocean. Next, please. Echoes of Big Thunder. On July 4th, 1776, a small but steadfast group of North American rebels banded together, vowed to fight for their freedom and independence and led an unlikely but ultimately successful escape from the shackles of old world European domination. But you knew that. On July 4th, 1839, a small but steadfast group of North American rebels banded together, vowed to fight for their freedom and independence, and led an unlikely but ultimately successful escape from the shackles of old world European domination. Bet you didn't know that, <clears throat> unless that is, you live around the hill towns of Western Albany County or other select parts of the Hudson Valley, where you may have some knowledge of the so-called anti-rent wars of the 1830s and 1840s. 
You might also know it if you're someone like Bruce Kennedy, a documentary filmmaker living in Asheville, North Carolina. <clears throat> Kennedy is a direct descendant of one of the leaders of this little known uprising, a man named Dr. Smith A. Boughton, but known in this context as Big Thunder. You'll see why in a bit. Boughton was Kennedy's great, great, great grandfather. Kennedy grew up in Troy and his grandmother lived nearby in the town of Averill Park, near the Boughton ancestral home. Quote, as kids, we were marched up to visit my granny and she told us the story of the rebellion, Kennedy says. As a kid, it just seemed tiresome. Later on, we began to appreciate it. <clears throat> He's been tracking down source material and conducting interviews for several years now in order to portray this forgotten but important event. Quote, doing this story has become an obligation to honor the people who conducted this rebellion, he says, including his ancestor, Big Thunder. So Big Thunder, really? Why, why would he have called himself Big Thunder? The answer, inspired by the Boston Tea Party, the farmers disguised themselves as quote, calico Indians with costumes made from their wives' calico dresses and sheepskin masks and took names like Big Lion, Black Hawk, Red Wing, Thunderbolt, and yes, Big Thunder. They would sound tin dinner horns and the Indians would gather to disrupt property sales, resist evictions, tar and feather opponents, and cause other acts of mayhem. And in doing so, they eventually brought down the end of the old feudal system of uh, working for the patroons who owned all the land up and down the Hudson Valley. Next, thank you, Seeking Truth. Even if she hadn't changed her name, Isabella Bomfrey would likely still be remembered now, nearly 130 years after her death, for the brave and life-changing work she did. But Bomfrey did change her name, wonderfully so, and it has permanently cemented her in the pantheon of American historical figures. Indeed, today's best marketing and branding experts could not improve on the moniker she chose, Sojourner Truth. Even those who aren't quite sure what she did can tell by that name what she stood for. And yet many of those who are able to describe her self-chosen mission to quote, travel up and down the land, speaking truth to power, may not remember that she began her travels in the Hudson Valley, where she lived for the first 30 years of her life. Question, where did she grow up? The answer in Ulster County, in uh, the town of Swartkill. Isabella Bomfrey was born circa 1797, one of 13 children of slaves named Elizabeth and James Bomfrey, who were owned by Colonel Johannes Hardenberg and worked his estate at Swartkill near what is now Rifton. This was still a heavily Dutch settlement and Bomfrey spoke only Dutch until the age of nine. She had a typically horrific slave's life. She was sold from her family around age nine, along with a herd of sheep for $100 to a man named John Neely. The Neelys spoke English and Isabella was savagely beaten for being unable to communicate. She said that Mrs. Neely once whipped her with, quote, a bundle of rods prepared in the embers and bound together with cords. She learned English here, but spoke with a Dutch accent the rest of her life. I think it's fascinating to know that she spoke with a Dutch accent. It tells, it speaks to the history of the Dutch in this area, which, you know, as, as we all know, is probably the only area in the country that has that kind of a Dutch, that kind of a history. Okay, Cliff, next please. Ah, they got legs. Legs Diamond, it was said, never met a friend he didn't double cross. Even by the dubious standards of depression era gangsters, he was no good. His enemies pumped so much lead into him that Dutch Schultz once asked his own henchman, quote, ain't there nobody that can shoot this guy so he don't bounce back? Yet by 1930, he was also the Hudson Valley's biggest celebrity a symbol of the little guy standing up to the heavy government hand of prohibition. After being forced out of New York City, <clears throat> he set up operations in Catskill 
And most of the locals knew he was running booze out of a brewery in Kingston. But government ag agents charged with enforcing the 18th Amendment could never figure out how. Raids in the early summer of 1931 finally uncovered the subterranean secret to his operations and led to the beginning of the end for Legs Diamond. The man who may have gotten his name for the way he could run for his life ran out of running room. Five months later, someone finally shot this guy so he didn't bounce back. Your question is, where was he shot? The answer was at a boarding house at 67 Dove Street in Albany. The bonus question is, who shot him? And if you think you know, you're wrong, because nobody knows. It's never been proven. It's been surmised that maybe the Albany cops did it themselves under the direction of the boss, Dan O'Connell. It might have been a jealous girlfriend. It might have been other mobsters, but nothing has ever been proven. Next, please. Okay, for you FDR fans, here's my FDR story. The picnic that won the war. The most famous hot dogs in history were served on June 11th, 1939. They were served at a picnic hosted by a well-known Hyde Park family, the Roosevelts. Guests included a well-known British family, the Windsors. The Windsors had never before sampled hot dogs and found them at first confounding. How do you eat this? Mrs. Windsor whispered to her host. She decided to use a knife and fork, ignoring Mr. Roosevelt's culinary advice to use her hands. Her husband, however, consumed his the American way. The Windsors, by all accounts, enjoyed the tubular treats, and this is how they became the most famous hot dogs in history. These hot dogs, you see, helped save the Western world from the Nazis. The hosts, of course, were better known as the President and First Lady of the United States, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. The guests were more commonly referred to as King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. The picnic and the events surrounding it <clears throat> were historic in a number of ways. This was the first time a reigning British monarch had ever set foot on US soil, including colonial times. It came at a time when Europe was at the brink of war. These facts were not mere coincidence. At the time, US government policy was isolationist. Relations with our cousins across the pond were at best cold and distant, but Britain needed our help. FDR wanted to provide that help, but needed to persuade the public both that it was a good idea and that the Brits were worthy. Political genius that he was, FDR invited the royal couple to a picnic at his place. So the question is, several years ago, there was a movie about the Roosevelt's called Hyde Park on Hudson, which depicted this event. Who played FDR in that movie? As you may or may not remember, it was Bill Murray, who at the time actually lived in the Hudson Valley and was also a very controversial choice to play FDR. Uh, I happen to think he did a good job. That's uh, a topic for another presentation, perhaps. Next, please. New York's Main Street. In March 1954, the citizens of Sleepy Hollow were especially sleepy. So sleepy, in fact, that a writer in the New York World Telegram suggested that, quote, Residents of this historic community think maybe the name will have to be changed to Insomnia Hollow. The reason? Construction of the $600 million state throughway bridge across the three mile Tappan Zee of the Hudson. Crews were operating pile drivers 24 hours a day to make up for time lost to bad weather, the article says. Police switchboards were swamped with complaints. Some people claimed their beds shook and no rest for the weary was in sight. Quote, Bert Sanders, project manager, said he was very sorry, but the nocturnal pounding will have to continue for the next eight weeks. Sleep loss may have been one of the earliest consequences of the New York State Thruway, but it was hardly the only one. The new road, dubbed the Main Street of New York State, in early promotional material, changed how people in the Hudson Valley and throughout the state lived, worked, and played. It also predicted similar changes across the United States, as it in large part inspired the nascent interstate highway system <clears throat> that transformed the country in the late 50s and 60s. That same pro promotional flyer 
even predicts that because the thruway was, quote, arousing national interest, it would inevitably become, quote, one of America's top tourist attractions. Okay, so no one would mistake the thruway for Mount Rushmore. But you can forgive the enthusiasm. In the 1950s, superhighways were a concrete symbol, literally, of America's newfound post-war power. They signaled the triumph of the automobile as the country's preeminent mode of transportation and mythological totem. And they forever altered the way, and they forever altered, and they forever altered life everywhere they flowed, starting here. The most striking example is that sleep-shattering new bridge across the Tappan Zee. The bridge opened in 1955, and in the next two decades, Rockland's population density nearly tripled from 500 to 1,300 people per square mile because now it was accessible to New York City. Your question now, <clears throat> why did the very stable geniuses of the day build the bridge over the very widest part of the river where it would cost the very most money? The answer, of course, is money and politics. The Port Authority controlled all the money up to the point where the Tappan Zee starts. So the newly uh, created Thruway Authority wanted, of course, to keep all the toll money. So they had to build a bridge outside of the Port Authority's jurisdiction, but as close to New York City as possible. That just happened to fall at the Tappan Zee, where they'd have to build the most expensive bridge. New York politics, it was always thus. Next, please. Get your beer here. One of my favorite stories. America was once a nation of brewers. According to an article in the New Yorker, there were about 4,000 regional breweries in 1873. Then came prohibition, which killed off most local brewers nationwide. The rest were snuffed out by the rise of mass production following prohibition's repeal. That also put our native beer's variety, freshness, and flavor on the verge of extinction. By 1965, there was just one craft brewer left standing, Anchor Brewing in San Francisco. Then in the 1980s, the brewery laws changed. Now, thanks to changing laws and changing palates, there are more than 1,500 breweries nationwide, the highest number in a century. There are now some tax benefits to opening a small brewery. And that's when the craft beer boom really got going. As defined by the Brewers Association, a craft brewery produces less than 2 million barrels a year. A barrel contains two kegs to give you a recognizable frat party kind of reference. A microbrewery produces less than 15,000 barrels. A brew pub serves at least a quarter of its beer in-house. Hudson Valley brewers are at the small end of microbrewing. Quote, what we brew in a year, the big breweries spill in a day, said Brown Brewing's co-owner, Kelly Brown. Here's your question. Beer has been a part of the Hudson Valley as long as people have been here, at least as long as Europeans have been here. Um, it was probably brought over on the half moon. Um, it was among the first businesses set up by the Dutch. The English followed suit. In fact, it was so reputable that one of Hudson Valley's most famous citizens earned his fortune and had a college started in his name based primarily on his brewing business. I don't think you need to wait. The answer, of course, is Matthew, v Matthew Vassar. In 1799, Matthew's brother Thomas Vassar planted Dutchess County's first ever acre of barley. And in 1801, he began the family's American brewing concern. Vassar went on to buy a stake in a successful cloth cutting machine, invest in real estate, help incorporate Poughkeepsie Savings Bank, become president of the Hudson River Railroad, dabbled in the whaling industry, and developed an aqueduct, selfishly, of course, to bring water to his brewery, which continued to thrive. So we are 40 minutes in. Um, do you want to start with questions? If there are questions, I can answer them. Or I can keep reading, whatever you guys want. What do you think?
Well, I'll start uh, with the question because great presentation. Um, Thank you. It really is fascinating. But of course, I'll start with the Roosevelt uh, question um, because of course the Roosevelts are just one of many families that moved up along uh, the Hudson River um, during the period of the mid to late 19th century. You know, the Vanderbilts moved, lived up here, the Mills, um, the Astors. It was quite a, a collection of wealthy people living along the Hudson River. Can you explain a little bit why they all moved up? They all had mansions in New York. Why did they move up to this area and why so many of them? Well, it started probably, uh, well, it did start around the Gilded Age when New York City was getting exceedingly crowded and exceedingly dirty. Um, so the rich, of course, didn't want to be bothered with that kind of stuff. Uh, it was also facilitated first by the steamship travel and then by the railroads. So, of course, much of history is determined by transportation. Once it was easy to get back and forth, um, that's when people moved. It's also why all the mansions are on one side of the river and not the other, because that side had the railroad. Um, that's pretty much what facilitated it. Of course, they had all the money in the world. The land was cheap. They could build their mansions tax-free. Um, so that's pretty much why. So it was a combination of a, a dirty city and easy transportation. So on the other end of the spectrum, why did they build Sing Sing Prison where they did? <laughs> um, I think, again, because the land was cheap, I, I can't remember exactly why they picked that spot. Um, but, but the funny thing about that is that it, it's why we still sometimes, at least those of us of a certain age, say when somebody's being sent to prison, they're being sent up the river. Um, that comes from the days when the gangsters of the Depression era were sent up to Sing Sing, and they were literally sent up the river. Well, it, it, one of the things that I was um, sort of quite amazed at when I first moved up here from Washington, D.C., uh, was that in, in D.C. along the Potomac River, it's parkland in most places. You know, right. uh, you have the CNO Canal that runs from D.C. all the way up to Harper's Ferry, whereas along here, the, the riverfront, which you would always think of as the most valuable property, the railroad tracks on both sides. Right. Uh, and, and of course, that development of the, the railroads involved someone named Vanderbilt. Do you want to talk about the development of the railroads and how that impacted New York and the origins of Grand Central Station? It's a little bit outside of the Hudson River, but it's all connected. Yes, well, I mean, the railroads were certainly integral to developing the valley and then the rest of the country. And it's funny, one of the first famous authors to move to the valley was, of course, Washington Irving. And he had beautiful um, views of, of the Tappan Zee and unlimited access and he was there before the railroads. And when Vanderbilt built the first railroad, he was not happy because it cut right across his, basically his front yard. And he had to put up with trains rumbling through his yard every day. So um, he was there in the, what would be called the good old days before the trains came. Um, yeah, the trains of course were one of the three or four ways that people of that era made the most money, trains, banking, and um, real estate essentially. Um, Vanderbilt cornered the market with his, um, you know, as, as they all did in those days, and created the way for people to travel. So travel got people out of the city, those with money first settled the area, um, then others, as they were able, came up, and then the towns and villages started to pop up around them. Um, so, so railroads were integral to everywhere in the country. Wherever railroads went, towns sprang up. Wherever towns sprang up, people came. Um, you know, so you can pretty much trace the development of the country through where the railroads went, and you know, then later where the highways went. Um, when the interstate highway came, it killed a lot of the towns that were on the main, you know, off roads like Route 66 or Route 9 that goes up through the valley. They were thriving towns uh, before the throughway. When the throughway came by, a lot of them. Unfortunately, you know, we're left for dead. Some have come back and some are doing okay, but others weren't. So transportation is always key to where people live and, you know, where they settle. Oh, okay. I see a question here. What do you feel Albany can do to highlight its rich history better? Is historic preservation at a high enough level? What can be done to better focus preservation? Well, you know, those of us who love history will always say, no, they're not doing enough. They should always do more. Um, it always comes down to money, of course. Um, 
most of the communities in the Hudson Valley are trying. They're doing a better job than they did when I first moved here 30 years ago. Um, it takes people talking about it. I think it takes books like mine, I hope, which is sort of a more popular look at the history of the Hudson Valley. It doesn't have to be all dry and academic, not to say that there isn't a place for that, but it can also be a fascinating and fun way to learn about where you live. Um, how else can we promote history? We can talk about it to people and talk about it in a way that makes it interesting. You know, I, my, I like to say that half the word history is story. So it's all about how you tell the story. Um, a fun story, a funny story when it's appropriate, a, um, you know, a sad story when that's appropriate is the best way to promote the history of anywhere, in my, in my humble opinion. So uh, what about some of the artists who lived up here? They also were not big fans of when the railroad came in, but the Hudson River Valley School of Artists is really quite famous in some ways considered the origins of um, American art. Talk about them for a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And in the um, chapter that I wrote about the Ice Age, uh, the geologists talk about how everything that the Hudson Valley School painters painted is thanks to the glacier. The glacier is what carved the river, carved the mountains, carved the waterfalls. Um, the Catterskill Waterfall, which is one of the first paintings that Thomas Cole painted and made famous, is a direct result of the glaciers. Um, yes, it was the first so-called American school of art. It uh, came at the same time as a transcendentalist school of philosophy, which of course um, played up nature and uh, the majestic qualities of a natural setting. And it sort of played down the urban decay that was starting to happen at the time. Uh, the Hudson Valley being so close to New York had the fortune of attracting a lot of artists who um, you know, captured this area so well and also captured something about the spirit of the Americas, you know, in the early 1800s. So again, the river and the valley all are central to the art. And, uh, you know, everything else that happens in, the, in this area is really owed to the river and the valley, which is kind of why the cover is the way it is. You know, the natural setting, we all in this day and age have been a little bit removed from nature. Uh, maybe more than a little bit removed from nature, but nature is what made this area what it is. It's why people settled here. It's uh, the river provided the transportation that made commerce easy. Uh, it's so beautiful. It made vacationing uh, desirable. The weather, not so great, but you know there are a lot of worse places in the world. Um, so it's all owed to the natural beauty of this area. And uh, you know we can all thank that. And we should all be really more appreciative of it and get out in it more, especially during a pandemic when there's not much else to do. Now, uh, your chapter on the first peoples and uh, that talk was very interesting. We had an author on a couple of years ago for the Hudson Valley History Reading Festival who uh, was a, a park ranger who talked about uh, the stone uh, sculptures and monuments and, and formations that uh, the indigenous people uh, created all around the Hudson Valley. Um, some of them in the shape of turtles, many of them are all along meridian lines mm -hmm. that align with equinox or solstice. Uh, do you talk about that at all in your book and are you familiar with some of those formations? I'm familiar with them. I don't really address them much in, the, in my book. Um, my, my book talks more about how they lived and then how they were essentially wiped out. Wow. Um, but I know I am aware of that, and you know that's true of most prehistoric peoples around the world. That's how they communicated. That was their version of art. That was their science. So it's certainly not surprising that there would be things like that in this area. Um, what, what I learned most from writing the story about the natives was that they're still around. And wow. we all tend to think that they're all dead and gone, but they're not. They, again, were settled eventually in Wisconsin but they have a presence here now, people who live in the Albany area. Even, even just this past month or two, there's been a controversy about some Native American murals being posted on a new bridge uh, over the Northway. Um, so they're still being treated poorly. They were promised to have these murals put up and then weren't and never got a good explanation why. Fortunately, it turned out okay and the murals are now up. But it, it, it brings to mind you know, the story uh, Faulkner's famous quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. You know, we're still treating the natives poorly, but they're still around and they still deserve our respect 
And, uh, you know, that's really what I focused on in my, uh, in the chapter in my book. Which historic site is the HUD is your best kept secret? Okay, well, I know that one of the next speakers has a book about that. So he'll know more than that, more about that than me. Um, I don't know about best kept secrets. I, it's not a secret at all, but I love the uh, walkway over the Hudson. And um, in fact, I have a little chapter in my book that so we have, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left, but maybe I can read it. It's a story about me walking across the uh, walkway. Some of the stories in my books, in my book are personal essays. That's why it's called a occasionally personal history. Um, as I said, I'm not a historian, I'm a journalist. So maybe I can uh, read that story. And Cliff, if you're listening, if you could put up that Weathering Heights slide, maybe I'll read that and bring it home, if that's all right. Great. Um, and if you can't, I'll read it anyway. Anyway, the story is called Weathering Heights, and it's about walking across the, um, the walkway over the Hudson. I didn't used to be a wuss, and I'm not sure exactly when I became a wuss, but now a wuss is what I am. And my wussiness reared its wussy head about 50 yards into my family's initial four-way, foray on the walkway over the Hudson. Hello, my name is David, and I'm an acrophobe. I'm afraid of heights. I'm not fearful by nature. Really, I have no other phobias. I'll eat, when, I'll eat just about anything. I'll go just about anywhere. Snakes, no problem. Bugs, don't love them, but happy to kill spiders when my wife asks. Germs, please. I play hockey. Have you ever been in a hockey locker room? But about 25 years ago, out of the blue, I suddenly got, I believe the technical term is creeped out when driving over a bridge. Looking down from a balcony or rooftop shivered me timbers. I couldn't get within 10 feet of a cliff edge. I never had this problem as a kid. I remember thinking, what the hell is this? And I still think that every time I feel its wussy presence. It's not always a logical phobia, which I suppose is an oxymoron, isn't it? I'm fine in airplanes, but not so much in cars. Inside the penthouse, I'm all, look at that view. Out on the terrace, I'm jello in a moving subway. My family, of course, is well aware of my predicament. Are you gonna be okay with this? My wife Kimberly asked when she saw me slide to the absolute center of the walkway. I'm fine, I barked in one syllable. Since I was clearly not fine, my daughter Grace then asked me every three minutes or so, <clears throat> are you okay, daddy? Are you okay, daddy? Are you okay, daddy? I'm going to push through this, I told them. It's not a petrified, stuck to the ground, unable to move fear. I just feel a bit queasy. My anxiety needle ticks up a couple of notches, like when a cop car pulls in behind you and follows you for a few minutes before he tears off after the other guy. I'm going to make it across, I told myself. But man, it's really high up here. Meanwhile, a grand parade passed me in each direction. Some were on foot, <clears throat> runners, walkers, limpers. Some were on wheels, bikers, skateboarders, rollerbladers, babies in strollers, seniors in wheelchairs. Dogs could do it. Cats could do it. Yes, someone had a cat on a leash. All of them seemed completely oblivious to the fact that they were 100 plus feet above a turbulent river and could, could, could what exactly, I asked myself. Reasoning with a phobia is like arguing with a Fox News fan, but I tried anyway. Could the bridge collapse? Short of a major earthquake or terrorist attack? No, it couldn't. Could you fall off? Short of the previous two events, are you downing a fifth of bourbon? No, you couldn't. What else you got, Freddy Cat? I challenged myself. I knew I had nothing to fear but my fear itself. Then, just then, a tiny boy, not more than four or five, zipped past me on a tricycle. His head was down, his legs were pumping furiously. He was having the kind of pure fun only a tyke on a trike can have. And he was 100 plus feet above a turbulent river. I said, what else you got, wuss? I got nothing. So I made it to the other side of the river and walked back with my family. I still hewed to the center rivets mostly, but I did edge toward the edge to read the informational placards on each side of the bridge. And by the end, I'd found a steady state, a walking rhythm that let me actually enjoy where I was. 
It really is quite beautiful up there. And it really is quite beautiful here in the Hudson Valley. We're all very fortunate to live here. Well, that seems like a perfect time to end. I, I share your enthusiasm. I love uh, the bridge, the walkway. I go out there regularly. I ride my bike out there. Uh, and and it's, I think it's one of the great urban redevelopment projects. Here was this rusting eyesore mm -hmm. health hazard that's been turned into one of the great tourist attractions for upstate New York. Uh, and it, And it's just extraordinary, especially in the fall when the leaves change color on both sides and you stand in the middle of the river. Yep. Uh, it's an experience that uh, unlike any other. David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great. Uh, I loved your talk. Uh, and, you know, I, I get to talk about the mid 20th century Hudson Valley a lot. I don't get to talk about the mid 250 million years ago Hudson Valley. So it's great to hear about that as well. Well, now I, you can. I hope you thank can you join very much for having me. Soon. Thank you. All right, we'll be uh, taking a short break, about five minutes. Uh, we'll be back with our third uh, author today. Uh, great talk. Uh, and so we'll see you in a few minutes.